A trip to the hospital is seldom a good thing. However, the horrors found within those walls of experiences of those who have suffered within them are numerous. Prepare yourself for a night filled with the most terrifying stories from hospitals. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My father is a doctor, and I sometimes go with him to different hospitals that he works at. There's one in particular that stands out though. This hospital used to basically be a death camp for people that got tuberculosis. They'd send them there for fresh air to heal them, and they'd die because there wasn't any real cure. Very many people died this way in the hospital, and the building in general is old and creepy looking. When he sees patients, I hang out with the nurses slash PAs. Because of working there, a lot of the staff have gotten into things like Ouija boards, recorders, ghost tours and more. So that's also cool and I've heard some of their recordings and such, and here are some of the stories that they've told me. Until last year, there was an old elevator that was known for sometimes stopping on either the second or fourth floor before taking you to where you actually wanted to go. This wouldn't be a big deal normally, but this hospital is strangely laid out. It's a four-story building, but only the first and third floors are in operation. The fourth and second floors are like a typical abandoned building, complete with broken wheelchairs, outdated medical equipment, and no working lights. My dad has gotten stuck on the abandoned floor several times in the past, and people have claimed to have a bad experience there. Patients who would report seeing the same people in their rooms. There was one incident that involved several patients complaining about little boys and girls coming into their rooms at night time. Apparently, my father had this one person, Jean. Jean was the loveliest of ladies. She was going on 80 and still quite strong but was in there for a routine medical check and needed a few tests done and needed to stay for a few days, just in case it was worse than they expected. As for what it was exactly, I can't remember. But what I can remember is that on her first night, Jean called on the little bell and a member of staff came to assist her. Apparently, she said that she wasn't annoyed, but asked that if they could keep the little girl out of her room as she was trying to sleep. So the nurse that had assisted the call had a look around, but of course visiting hours were over a long time ago, and there were no children on this ward. Nonetheless, she asked about and had a look, no one could be found. Confused, she went and asked Jean again if she was sure about what she'd seen, and she was adamant, saying that she stood in the room and let out a little giggle before walking out, and that although she wasn't scared, she was confused. So, she went back and asked security to review the footage and let her know where the little girl came from and where she went to. I mean, it was unlikely, but it could be possible that someone slipped in and slipped out. So the nurse carries on with her rounds, and after a while she gets buzzed and told to come up to review the footage, together. They're both looking at it, and it's very clear to see that no one left that room at all. 
Now, some people could chalk this up to her being in her old age, but the creepy part is what happened next. Jean came and went, and a few weeks after that, a different nurse had a similar call from another patient, saying that a little girl had come into the room, stood in the corner, and after a while just left. This patient, however, was profoundly more creeped out than Jean. And when she asked the nurse about it, she again had a check, asked around, and that's when the story started to correlate. There are a few more about the little boy, but they're pretty similar. There are also occasions where several patients say they will refuse to stay in their room again after the first night. Most of us attribute this to not only seeing the ghosts of the children, but the feelings they get when they don't see them. People also hear screams and children's laughter emanating from their rooms or the grounds. Needless to say, they are all very confused and very scared. Finally, the hospital has such a reputation that a horror movie was filmed on the third floor, and staff kept noticing noises that were messing up the filming coming from upstairs. They went downstairs and asked the staff to tell the nurses on the fourth floor to quiet down. No one had worked on the fourth floor in a very long time. I'm a paramedic. One day, I brought a guy to the hospital who had a single strand from a metal dog hairbrush embedded in his hand. Probably not even worth calling me out. Should have got a cab to the hospital, but hey, basically about an inch long metal splinter. Very thin, very metal, stuck in the palm of his hand. There wasn't any of it sticking out. Now everyone knows this is an easy one. Get some metal pliers, make a small incision just to get the end of the splinter, and literally pull the thing out without snapping it. Bit of antiseptic wipe and a plaster. Five minute job. Only bother with local anaesthetic if the patient is a screamer. No problem. Leave the junior doctor with the guy. I had to get back on the road, but I heard the rest from the guys next time I was in. Apparently, support staff came back to the room after 20 minutes, as the doc wasn't out yet. And it turns out the doc had taken a scalpel and had hacked about an inch squared of the guy's hand out. To try and get the splinter enough to pull it out with just his fingers. When the doctor's fingers kept slipping on the splint, which was covered in blood. He literally hacked out more and more flesh just to try and get a better handhold of it. There was blood everywhere, and after about an inch had been hacked out of the guy's hand, he was obviously badly scarred for life, over just nothing, a stupid splinter. Okay, not massively horrific, but the thing that gets to me is they are all strictly told by a senior to not tell the guy or anyone what a complete dog's dinner the whole event had been, and that the guy was really thankful to the dog, and even sent a thank you card written like a three-year-old because his hand was so messed up. All the junior doctor's colleagues were really supportive of the doctor, who had a real shrug your shoulders, who cares about a person's life attitude. For some reason that just sticks with me. There was no remorse whatsoever from the doctor. What a dick. Do your job. Working in a community memory clinic, I go to do a home visit to assess a patient who had been referred to us. It's a man in his 70s with some kind of chronic lung disease. I forget what probably COPD, which meant he was on oxygen at home. He was more or less with it, only mild dementia, 
and the assessment was going pretty well. I was copying down a list of his current medication from a pile of prescription sheets, when suddenly I can smell smoke. I look up, and the guy is calmly smoking a cigarette, seemingly unconcerned about the fact that the cigarette is only a couple of inches away from his nasal oxygen tubes. Trying not to sound panicked, I ask him to put out the cigarette, which he obligingly does, but stubbing it out on the oxygen tank. Another case was in a child's psych ward. There was this extremely anxious teenage girl with recurrent sleep paralysis. She reported waking up in the middle of the night, unable to move, and being aware of several shadowy figures in her room, clustered around her bed and staring at her. This had been going on for a few weeks, and just prior to her being referred to us, she had started seeing the shadow people when she was awake, always watching her from somewhere in her peripheral vision. Another case in the child's psych ward, five-year-old girl with some variation on a theme of high-functioning autism, who I was doing a neurodevelopmental assessment on. During the appointment, she begins telling me a story about how she had been playing in the woods. She got lost, and the shining people had found her and hidden her in the place under the hill. Her parents had gone looking for her, and the shining people had made a doll out of sticks and leaves, which they gave to her parents, and made them think was her. There was something incredibly creepy about the way she told the story, particularly when I was playing along to see where this was going, and asked her how she escaped. And she looked at me straight in the eyes for the only time during the entire appointment and said, I didn't. The last story is a high security psychiatric unit on a night shift at around 4am. We had a policy that the uncle doctor had to do twice nightly visual checks on all patients in seclusion rooms. Each door had an observation window, which had a cover to the outside that could be slid open to look into the room. Slid the hatch open on one room to find myself face to face with the patient, who was standing motionless, eyes unblinking, and his face pressed up against the glass. I've worked in a hospital for a while, and a lot of horrors come to mind. I once saw two patients die from bleeding through their carteroids, a major blood vessel in the neck. Both had a recent tracheotomy, and an infection slowly ate the blood vessel lining until it burst open. Truly, some gory stuff. I didn't see this one, but heard about it multiple times. A suicidal patient managed to commit suicide by carefully observing the staff schedules, and did it right after the evening shift went home, so only the night staff were there. He used the TV power cord and put himself on his knees until he died. But that was not the worst. To make sure the staff would be delayed as much as possible, he spread shit all over the room, and especially around himself. All I can say is that in the end, he succeeded. Another incident. Confused patients can be creepy too, saying things like, please don't let them take me, or who's that behind you? while only you and the patient are in the room. You get used to it, and manage to even comfort the patients after a while, but sometimes it leaves me wondering. I've also heard a lot about people saying that patients feel their death is coming. 
I've stopped counting how many patients told me things like, I'm most likely not going to be here tomorrow, so thanks a lot for your care. I really appreciate it. Or, I'm going to die tonight. I know it. Only to die later on. Often when they say it, nothing's out of the ordinary with them. But they just know. How they know is something I probably won't find out until the end. Now, I'm not a believer in the supernatural, but some rooms in the hospital seem to be attracting death. And this happens in most units I can think of. It can be sometimes explained as these rooms have more facilities to accommodate the heaviest cases, both figuratively and literally speaking. But for the other normal rooms, I can find no rational explanation. This phenomenon seems to be able to move also from a room to another. For example, a few patients died in room 10. Then a patient is transferred from this room to room 20. And the phenomenon follows the patient. Yes, I know it's hard to believe. But after seeing it myself multiple times, I know something we don't understand is at work here. And I can't find a better way to explain it. I recall in a hospital I used to work in, there was a department where the employee's break room was right next to the elevators. Often during the night shift, nurses would go in during their breaks to sleep. One night, a nurse went to rest for a bit, but forgot to lock the door. The security guards then arrived during their rounds to check, opened the door to see a nurse sleeping with a homeless dude sleeping on the floor next to her. They managed to get the guy out without waking the nurse, but told her afterwards. They eventually locked those elevators with a code during the night. I've had a few colleagues tell me that they saw on multiple occasions patients acting really creepy in the ICU. Often these were hyperactive delirium patients, like the patients were really slow in most of what they do, or didn't move at all. But they had their eyes wide open, and fixed their gaze on whatever was in the room, or whoever, without blinking. Sometimes grunting at them, some of them even saying that they looked like they were possessed. I believe that in one or two cases, families bought priests for exorcisms. Yes, it's not a joke. Even doctors confirm this. And I don't remember if it worked, though. I believe most of them eventually healed and were acting normal upon discharge. Another event is that elevators stopped by themselves at random floors. And on opening the doors, there wouldn't be a soul to be seen. I am an outpatient care manager. I've worked with a lot of people who have pretty significant histories of drug abuse, violence, erratic behaviour, and a few people with murder convictions. For the most part, none of them fazed me too much. I've got all kinds of stories about the stuff that's happened with them, but I've only really had one client I've ever been afraid of. When he was new to the agency, I did his intake. He's a homeless guy in his early 60s, diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was currently living on the streets, and was open that he had serious issues with drugs. He talked about his violent outbursts. He would get angry and paranoid, and cut up other homeless guys he thought were out to harm him. While talking, I learned that he had been incarcerated previously for murdering his wife with a shotgun. He did so in his account, because he was depressed and the voices told him to kill her. Again, none of this typically was out of the ordinary, but what scared me was his attitude. He described the murder without any prompting, in a graphic but almost literate way, during which he smiled blissfully then finished by saying that after the murder was complete, 
he felt relieved, like a great heavy cloud lifted from his head. He was insightful about his symptoms, but didn't seem to care. Again, this was not the first person with a murder rap, nor the first with schizophrenia that I'd ever worked with, but he scared the shit out of me. It was an animal instinct, if anything. After that, he was assigned to me and I never really saw him again. Last I heard, he had left for his hometown, but I still see him around occasionally, or at least I think I do. I don't know exactly how he got released after incarceration, but it was probably parole. The vast majority of people with schizophrenia are not dangerous or violent, and some of my most productive case management relationships were with people who had schizophrenia. I have a feeling this guy had something else going on. I've worked in mental health for over 10 years. On the adult unit, we had a young, 21 years or so, patient who presented as extremely mentally sound. His speech was clear, his hygiene was really intentional, and his answers to every question were appropriate. He was admitted around lunchtime, he ate his meal, and then went to his room to take a nap. After about 10 minutes, he bursts out of his room stark naked, and walks through the whole unit like a robot. He goes to the wall, and pushes his front side of his naked body into the built-in called up fire hose, and yelled, I have to recharge. I once worked with a paediatric patient who had set her house on fire by dousing her younger sister with gasoline and lighting her sister on fire. I don't know what ended up happening to the younger sister. She was in the ICU when the older sister was on the paediatric psych unit. Her effect was completely flat the entire time. Yet she told jokes and talked constantly. She sang Taylor Swift's we're never going to get back together, in the flattest tone I've ever heard, over and over. When I worked at a lockdown state facility for children, I worked with an eight-year-old who had shot and killed his younger sister. He was in our facility for over a year, unlike every other child there. He never had any huge problems, no aggression, and followed the rules. He was a very sweet and compliant kid, but he also never showed any empathy for killing his sister, neither in therapy or around cottage staff. He just maintained that he didn't mean to kill her. He just wanted to see what would happen, but he only talked about it a couple of times. Over a year later, the state wouldn't pay much for him to stay in such secure placement, so he went to a treatment home and it was one of our nurses' homes. He said a couple of weeks after the kid moved in, another of his kids that had lived with him had complained that the new kid kept coming into his room at night and threatening him with knives. This kid lied a lot, but the nurse paid attention to what he was saying and tried to catch him. He didn't catch him, but the kid said it was still happening. So my nurse friend installed a camera, and sure enough, the sweet and compliant kid was creeping into his room at night with a knife he stole from a kid at school. He went back into the lockdown facility after that. I also worked with a kid that killed one week old puppies by throwing them off his third story apartment building. He told me about it and said that he threw some of them off one by one so we could hear each one crunch. The same kid killed a litter of kittens by ripping their paw pads off and letting them bleed out. According to his parents, they found him in the garage with the dead kittens and with blood wiped all over his skin. I'm currently living in New Jersey and relocated from the Midwest. And for the life of me, I cannot find a job working with mentally ill children because of a possession charge from 2012. My passion is mental illness, 
and my speciality is pediatric psychiatry. But just because of a stupid conviction, I can't do what I want to do. I have a wonderful job with lots of room for advancement. Ironically enough, it's a speciality pharmacy. But I still wish that I could help those with mental health issues. I'm a CNA who works with children. I had this girl named Laura. And she had come into the ER because she had overdosed. And let me tell you that she was barely awake when she got there. She wasn't able to talk, and when I would ask her if she knew where she was, she would look at me and blink her eyes like she knew what I was saying, but couldn't make sense of what to say. It was my job to sit with her and to keep an eye on her. I felt bad for her because I knew she was going to die possibly, and it was sad because she would die suffering, and I saw no hope in her. I greeted her. I didn't know if she could even hear me, because she was just so out of it. The paramedics told me everything that went on during the ride to the ER. That being that she was throwing up and having seizures. Soon after she got there, she started coughing up blood and was in pain. The nurses gave her stuff to hopefully take some of the pain away and help her vomiting. I was almost crying because I felt so bad for her. Soon, the hospital took her to a room, where she would be staying for a while. This is where it gets creepy. The next morning, her parents, the people who I thought were her parents, came in, and started loving on her, and I was chatting with them, and they told me so much about this girl, and how they had no idea. I told them that was the scary part. It's that a lot of teenagers don't say anything. They just do it. Her parents left the room. And not ten minutes later, a nurse pulled me aside and said her parents would be there in about ten minutes. Then I just looked at her and told her that they were just here. I asked her why they're coming back. She went white in the face and called the hospital police to come to this girl's room quickly. When they got there, the girl looked horrified. She couldn't speak, but her eyes said it all. I felt so bad, because these people had touched and kissed her, and I was standing there while the police came and were talking to the nurses. They talked to me as well and took my statement. They asked me what the parents looked like and what not. We managed to get the girl to speak with the strength she had, and she said that she had never seen them before in her life. The hospital ward went on lockdown, and it was pure craziness, with police coming and always getting statements. For the next few days, the girl got worse and worse, and on the seventh day, she started getting better and the police didn't feel the need to be in her room 24-7 since I was there. Three weeks went by, and she was released. About a week later, I got a call saying I was needed in the ER right away. I tore us out of there, down the hallway to get there quickly, and I heard a code blue when I arrived. When I walk in, it was the same girl. I quickly put on gloves and took over CPR, while the defibrillator charged. We managed to bring the girl back to life, and I found out that she had overdosed again, which this time was even worse. I thought for sure that was it. She was going to die. We got her to a room, and she was able to talk to us for about two days, and she was more alert, and started telling me all about these people. She said they were her birth parents, and that she was adopted when she was three. So they wanted her back. And since she's a blogger, they found her blog. And she posted that she was in a local hospital, which I shall not name for privacy reasons. They knew where that was. And since they were her birth parents, they were allowed back. All said and done, 
She was there for two weeks, and those people never returned, and I don't know what happened to them. The girl's doing just fine now. She even came and visited me once and looked a lot better. I got a phone call from a friend who was a cop, because I told him what went down, and he said that the two people were caught and were now in jail for a long time. I saw the girl the other day when she was in the hospital for a surgery, to hopefully fix the damage from the overdose to her liver. These are her words. My parents are wonderful, but they don't understand how important it is to keep my identity safe, and that my fake parents are always stalking me. I plan to press charges on them when I can, because you have to be 18 to press charges. The hospital I'm in doesn't care about you, and they don't care who visits, because I know some of you might be asking why they don't come and check who comes in. The truth is, they don't just take people's word. My parents who tried to take me back, please, let's not meet again. I was on my general surgery rotation. A man came into the emergency room with excruciating abdominal pain. He had been constipated for a few days. There's a term we use in medicine called rigid abdomen, and it describes the situation where the patient's abdomen is so screwed up that their muscles contract as hard as a board to try and reduce the pain. This guy had a rigid abdomen. He was adamant about not having a bag and almost refused an operation, but he would have died without it. And we finally got that fact through to him. So he signed his consent and we took him to the operating room. I'm sure most of you have heard other stories about the insides of people, so I'll reassure you that it wasn't that bad. He was a thin but unfortunate man. We were pretty sure that when we made our incision, we'd find some gnarly looking bowel. We certainly didn't expect to see shit. Spoiler alert, we did. There was literally shit in this guy's abdomen. Everything was brown. Fecal matter was hiding in every crevice. There was also an apple seed. I remember that part very clearly. I never did get the full story, but it seems that he tried eating an entire apple to help with his constipation. We also found the sticker. It took more than an hour to wash everything out, but there was still a chance that he could die. That was the scariest shit I'd ever seen, and we managed to save him. I was an x-ray technician for years. At one point, I worked the night shift, and I worked alone. One night, I had to x-ray a homeless man who had hurt his shoulder or something. Anyway, I had rolled him into the room and parked him against the door opposite where the control panel was. I got some film and was walking back into the room towards the man. And he looked at me and said, it's like watching an aquarium. You're surrounded. He went on to say I was surrounded by people and animals, and that I was also being watched by people from some native tribe that I've never heard of, and told me I should feel honored since they didn't follow just anyone. It was about 5 a.m. and this freaked me the hell out. For the only time in my life, I actually had that ice-cold feeling going down my spine. I know he was probably suffering from some mental issue, but isn't that just the type of person who does this? Weirdly, a year or so later when I was visiting San Francisco, I had a fortune teller stop me on the street and ask to do my reading. She said the same thing, that I was surrounded. So this happened about two years back, in paramedic training. 
So I live in an area that doesn't have too many people. Statesboro, Georgia. I'm doing training. Learning how to insert a tube inside someone to help them breathe. Which was very hard, because you have to do it right. Otherwise, you could end up hurting someone instead of helping them. And I was sleepy. I was driving home when I get a call from my cousin, Austin. He was saying his girlfriend had fainted, and I thought, great, now I have to go and check on her and make sure that she's okay. Because fainting can be harmless. But, in other times, people mistake fainting for something more serious. Now you need to know that Austin lives in the dead middle of nowhere. So I wasn't happy about going to his house, and around midnight on a full moon, because I read a lot of horror stories, and in the back of my head, I thought this wasn't going to end well. As for those of you who don't know about the full moon theory, it's where the full moon is out for some reason, and it makes people feel like they're sick, when they're really not. Now. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but it seems like the ER was always more full during the full moon. I was about five minutes away when I pulled up to the gate and the start of the driveway. I went up with my brights on and was going slow so that I could see. When I get up to the house, Austin was awaiting me and yelling that she's not breathing. And 911 is on its way. I instantly got out of the car, putting on my gloves and rushing to do what I could. I thought, what the hell? This isn't what I got called here for. And Austin doesn't have any medical training, so I thought it was a seizure or something. I got into the room where his girlfriend was and started doing CPR on her. Once I confirmed there was no pulse, and that she wasn't breathing. I told Austin to go wait outside for the ambulance, because I didn't want him to see his girlfriend dying. Now, living in the middle of nowhere means the paramedics would take a while to get there, even though the station was only about 10 minutes away. But the roads are very bumpy, so you really can't go more than 5 miles an hour. I was sweating by the time the paramedics got there, and they took over the CPR. They gave her something to help start her heart, which really worked well, because she started talking to us and was trying to fight us, which is normal coming back from the dead. It's confusing. We got her onto a stretcher and rolled her out into the ambulance and set out for the hospital. And when we called the hospital to say that we were coming, they said that they were on lockdown meaning that nobody was allowed to go in, nor out. I thought, shit, what are we going to do? We need to get this girl medical attention quickly, because in the back of an ambulance, you can't do much. We needed a cath lab and blood work ASAP. We decided to take her to the station, where we had more people and more stuff in case something went wrong. Again, this isn't uncommon. When we get to the station, we kept her in the ambulance, so we wouldn't have to move her again to go to the hospital. We went ahead and drew blood, and ran a few tests that we had, and did a 12-lead EKG, which is a standard for a heart patient. Everything came back normal, which is what I thought, which is good and bad, because there was nothing we could do to help her. But it also meant if something was going on, then it either went away on its own, or it's hiding somewhere else, possibly more harmful. When the hospital was no longer on lockdown, we took her, and I swear it looked like a ghost town, because it's a small ER, and not too many people go there, even though there was a full moon. Long story short, they went on lockdown because someone placed a call saying that there was a bomb, and so, of course, they had to go on lockdown, and later they found out it was a prank call. 
As for Austin's girlfriend, she ended up being airlifted to a hospital that was able to take better care of her. I once did a remodeling job in a hospital's oncology department. Because it was an active hospital, we had to do the work after hours. Many of the lights throughout the building were out, except for those that stayed on permanently, exit signs and whatnot, which made for a really creepy effect, not to mention a constant eerie hum and warnings about radioactive exposure posted here and there. I had been trying to listen to music on my phone and followed the score of an NBA playoff game, the one in which Ray Allen hit that three to spoil the Spurs' chance of a championship. But because the walls were lined with lead, the service reception was terrible, so I eventually gave up. There I am in a room by myself, in silence, except for the creepy hum of machines and lights just picturing the poor sick souls walking in and out of here on a daily basis, when suddenly there was a blood-curdling scream coming from down the hall. I was so scared shitless that I froze for a second. I thought surely I imagined it, because the hospital was closed. But then it came again, this time closer to where I was. So I looked around for possible weapons of which I only had a razor knife. I grabbed it and slowly exited the room and the scream came again. This time I could tell it was really close to me and it was followed by laughter and sounded like more than one voice. Now my intense fear is turning into confusion and finally the source of the screams comes into view. It was the cleaning crew of about three to four teenagers. They had been goofing off and apparently didn't think anyone else was there. The brownness in my pants though, surely wasn't appreciated after their antics. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. Hospitals are certainly creepy places. Definitely not places I enjoy spending extended amounts of time at. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please consider dropping a like and leaving a comment, as it goes a long way. I do post every single night to ensure that you have your spooks waiting for you when you go to sleep, so don't forget to hit the subscribe button, the little bell icon, and tune in tomorrow for even more horrors. If you have a story that you would like me to share on the channel, feel free to send it to my email or drop it in my Reddit. Either's fine. Just make sure the paragraph include punctuation and add lots of detail, as these are key factors when deciding whether to read a story or not. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.